The reason we should, we should consider nuclear energy fundamentally is because the energies that bind the nucleus uh, have two million times greater energy density than those that bind the electrons to the atom. And, and that is simply a physical fact that is unavoidable. It, it means that for a given amount of mass we can produce far more energy with nuclear reactions than we can with chemical reactions. And this is the reason that we see the entire universe is nuclear powered. Stars, uh, uh, even the reactions that happen inside our Earth, the, uh, the radioactive decay that drives geothermal energy, all of these things trace back to, to nuclear energy, to the energies of the nucleus. Now the technology that was chosen years ago uh, for releasing nuclear energy was based on using solid nuclear fuel and pressurized water as a coolant. And this technology is, uh, was originally developed for nuclear submarines. It was a very, very good fit for nuclear submarines, but has uh, certain deficiencies when we want to apply it to civilian nuclear energy, and these deficiencies have been increasingly manifest over the last 50 years. So if we want something better because we want to go hotter, we want to go hotter because we want to convert more of that wonderful thermal power into useful power, like electricity or shaft work. And so a big and important decision has to be made as, uh, what is these working fluids? What are these coolants? Now, there are, there are four basic categories of coolants you could consider for a nuclear reactor. There's water, of course, gas, metal, and salt. And all of them have been used successfully, but I like to think of things in a matrix because, again, we're engineers, and matrices are wonderful things. So let's think about uh, the pressure on one axis of these coolants and the temperature on the other axis. What we would really desire is to have low pressure and high temperature. And that's what this salt allows you, allows you to achieve, is a high, a high temperature yet low pressure coolant. And that's possible because of the inherent stability of the salts. They are, uh, they are they're very happy because they have full or empty electron shells. And, and they behave in many ways like a noble gas because they don't wish to react with other things because of that configuration. Uh, right now the coolant we're using, water, actually has both of the undesirable advantage, uh, situations. It runs at high pressure and yet it's still confined to a relatively low temperature. And so we're limited how efficiently we can generate electricity. There's another aspect of these coolants, and that's how much thermal energy they can contain. What's their volumetric heat capacity? And again, in this one, water really shines. It has excellent volumetric heat capacity, but the salt is even better. It outperforms it. So these categories together all point to the salt as being the right answer as a coolant for a reactor. There's yet another advantage though that must be considered. In today's reactors, we build nuclear fuel with extraordinary precision. I mean, it's really beautiful to see a, a, a fuel assembly. And it's sort of heartbreaking to think that this fuel assembly must then be disassembled at some point, and chopped up and taken apart, because you've gone to such exquisite care to make it. Uh, wouldn't it be better to have fuel that was already in a form where it could be chemically processed and utilized? And that's another thing that these salts allow you to do. So they're very safe, they're very versatile, they're chemically stable, again, because they have those full and empty electron shells. And they have an enormous unpressurized liquid range, about 1,000 degrees Celsius, once you bring them to a, their melting point of about uh, 400 degrees Celsius. This is what this particular lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride salt looks like uh, when it's carrying uranium as a fuel. It, gives it, a, a, it goes from being a transparent fluid to having a slightly green color to it. And we co sometimes call this salt fly. It's a nickname for uh, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride salt that I've adopted as the name for my company because uh, nobody knows what fly means. <laughs> but fly is a great material. It, it has uh, remarkable properties in a, in a nuclear reactor. And it's also impervious to radiation damage because of that ionic configuration. And this is something that I've come to appreciate, that you don't want to put covalently bonded materials inside a nuclear reactor if you can at all avoid it. Because there is no chemical bond stronger than the MeV particles that are going to hit it. It will always break up that chemical bond. An ionic bond, on the other hand, doesn't really care if it gets knocked around or dislodged or so forth. Because so long as cations and anions are in balance, the, the material retains its, its bulk capacity, uh, density, thermal conductivity, heat capacity. Those properties don't change under, even under prolonged radiation. That's a huge advantage in a nuclear reactor. There's another great advantage, too, with liquid fuel, and that is the ability to drain the fuel into a passively safe configuration in the event of a loss of coolant or a loss of control accident. This was actually demonstrated, I'll talk about in just a moment, during the operation of a molten salt reactor at Oak Ridge. So this is a simple, fail-safe, easy-to-understand safety system where 
In the event of loss of power, the salt simply drains out of the reactor into another vessel that is intentionally designed to release heat into the environment and, and, and allow it to be in a, a passively cooled configuration essentially indefinitely. As I mentioned, these, these uh, technologies were demonstrated uh, during the construction of a molten salt reactor experiment at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the 1960s. And here's the reactor vessel you can see. It's relatively modest in size. This reactor ran successfully for about five years, from 1965 uh, to 1969. Here's a picture of the primary heat exchanger to the reactor. And then the thermal energy was just dumped to the environment. It wasn't put through a power conversion system because this was simply an experiment. So they really weren't trying to make electrical energy. But in principle, had this been coupled to a power conversion system, it probably would have been able to generate electrical energy uh, 40 to 45 percent efficient, which is you know, really, really spectacular when you're talking about power conversion systems. And it's because of the high temperature. Uh, the reactor was relatively compact. You can see a, a man to scale. There's the reactor vessel primary heat exchanger, primary pump, and uh, this configuration is, is actually still intact at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. It was safe and simple and easy to control, and uh, I think this would be a great comfort to the public to know uh, what the reactor operators who ran this experiment told me. I said, what was it like to run the molten salt reactor? They said, it was really boring. Nothing ever happened. And the reactor was very, very well behaved. And I thought, that's good. We engineers like boring things that shows <laughs> Hollywood can have drama and thrills and flashing red lights and smoke alarms and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> we want to go into a machine that is just going to sit there and be boring forever. That makes us happy. Uh, another really important accomplishment of the molten salt reactor team, though, was that they were able for over 20,000 hours to safely maintain the reactor. And they told me that many people had told them, yeah, sure, you can build it, but you won't be able to maintain it. It'll be too challenging. And so they were very proud of their ability to do this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, President Nixon uh, came into office and he said, we've got to cut the budget, Atomic Energy Commission. Quit, quit messing around with all of these different ideas for how to make breeder reactors and just pick one. Well, they picked the, the wrong one because this fellow was in charge. His name's Milt Shaw. And he said, we don't want anything other than plutonium fast breeder reactors. That's it. That's all we want. We're putting all of our money in that category. And they spent billions of dollars in the United States, and I know they spent billions of dollars in Japan and France and England, all on plutonium fast breeder technologies. And ultimately, uh, in the United States at least, they were, they were canceled, and in most other countries as well. What should have happened, though, at this point, was somebody should have raised their hand and said, wait a minute, we canceled the thorium molten salt reactor for this, and now you've canceled this. Why don't we go back and look at thorium again? Why don't we go and reconsider that decision? As far as I can tell, that never happened. It should have happened, but it didn't. So the path that was not taken was almost completely forgotten. Now, of course, our society hasn't forgotten its needs for reliable, uh, constant, uh, safe energy. That's not going to go away. And we do have new nuclear reactors under construction, some in the United States, many in China, and so forth. But at least in the United States, we're retiring reactors faster, quite a bit faster, in fact, than we're building. So we're falling behind in, in having new nuclear energy. So how can we change this? How can we upend the paradigm of, of closing out uh, energy-dense and reliable energy source? And, and one of the ways that people are very excited about is this idea of modular nuclear reactors, the idea that you could build reactors in a factory that were, uh, could then be taken to a site in, in, in pretty much the uh, right assembled configuration and, and, and with minimal preparation be ready to be put on the grid. Well, the molten salt reactor technology that was developed at Oak Ridge was, was a small modular reactor before small modular reactors were cool. This is a, a schematic of a, a two-reactor design that they did in 1967. So, so they were way ahead of their time in thinking about how you can do this. And part of that was because they realized that with this low pressure, high power density salt, you could build smaller reactor vessels, smaller systems. Everything got smaller and more compact and more amenable to potentially factory development. And this is certainly the direction that we're interested in taking is the idea that we're going to build modular reactors. Now let's talk about fuels for a moment because nature has given us three basic options for nuclear fuel. And these come from the three uh, nuclear fuels. Uh, of course uranium, which we're familiar with. Most of uranium is uranium-238. That is not directly usable for energy. Only a tiny sliver of uranium is uranium-235, which is our only naturally occurring fissile material. Thorium is about three times more common than, than uranium, but it consists entirely of a single isotope, which, like uranium-238, is also not ready to produce energy right off the bat. It has to undergo a transformation. 
So most nuclear fuels, you can see both uranium and thorium, are potential fuels. They're not there yet. But they could be turned into energy sources. Well, how can that be done? This was realized very early in the 1940s by a brilliant uh, chemist named Glenn Seaborg at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. He was bombarding uh, uranium with, with neutrons, and he found that it turned into a new, a new uh, material, plutonium, and that, that material was fissile. You could strike it with yet another neutron, and it would fission, releasing energy and additional neutrons. So basically, instead of taking one neutron to fission, like uranium-235, it took two. One to convert it into a fissile material, and the next one to actually cause it to fission. Now this is all a great idea, so long as that fission generates more than two neutrons. Unfortunately, in the case of plutonium, it didn't. It generated less than two neutrons. And so that's why uh, the idea of a plutonium breeder came to a stop. Thorium, on the other hand, if it was struck by a neutron, would form uranium-233, and then would fission producing over two neutrons. And this is really the big deal, is the idea that the fission of uranium-233 produces enough neutrons to continue the conversion and fission of additional uranium-233. Now there is a way to get uranium-238 to breed, and that is to use fast neutrons. If plutonium is fissioned by a fast neutron, then it will produce more than two neutrons, and that is sufficient to allow it to, to breed and, and thus to use uranium-238 as a fuel source. This is the persistent appeal of the fast breeder reactor, the idea that if you go to using fast neutrons in a fast reactor where neutrons are not slowed down by a moderator, then you can breed with it. And this has been uh, the source of interest in many different countries. Certainly almost all the countries of Europe have been interested in the fast breeder reactor. But there's a big disadvantage to a fast spectrum reactor, and that is that the atoms themselves are far less reactive in the fast spectrum. So this is what a plutonium atom looks like to a fast neutron. And that's what a plutonium atom looks like to a thermal neutron, to a neutron that has been slowed down, that has bounced around in some water or some graphite or something to take away that energy. Now, I can tell you, gentlemen and ladies, I don't have the foggiest idea why this is the way it is. All I know is it is. Thermal neutron cross-sections are huge compared to fast neutron cross-sections. And so it, I, I drew this picture so you get an idea of how many atoms of plutonium it would take in the fast spectrum to equal one in the thermal spectrum. It's a lot. But the problem with plutonium is represented by this wedge of, of red here in that it quite often absorbs the neutron. It doesn't always fission. In the fast spectrum, it fissions essentially all the time. But in the thermal spectrum, it eats the neutron about one out of three times. That's the big problem with plutonium. That's why you can't breed in a thermal spectrum reactor with plutonium. You have to go to a fast breeder reactor and you run into this problem. So if you could have a reactor that could breed in the thermal spectrum, that would be a tremendous advantage. Well, guess what? You can. You can by using the thorium fuel cycle. So here it is in a little more detail. Thorium will absorb a neutron, throwing off a gamma ray, uh, and becoming thorium-233, which has a short half-life, only about 22 minutes. It then beta decays to protactinium-233, which has a substantially longer half-life, about 27 days. Remember that because we're going to talk about that more in a moment. It will then beta decay to uranium-233, and now it's available as a fuel. Now it's struck by a neutron. It will fission 91% uh, of the time uh, into the fission reaction rather than absorbing a neutron and becoming U-234. And that's the best capture to fission ratio of any material in the thermal spectrum. And that's really why thorium and uranium-233 are such a performer. This is the central advantage of thorium. This is why it's, if we use it as a nuclear fuel, we can sustainably consume it, and we can almost eliminate the production of transuranic waste. And the reason that's possible is because we're starting about six <coughs> atomic mass units lower than uranium-238. Uranium-238 only has to absorb one neutron, and we have transuranic material, plutonium, and americium, and curium, and so forth. On the other hand, with thorium, we start clear down here at 232. When we form U-233, 90% of it will fission. So imagine a freeway where 90% of the cars are taking the exit ramp. So only 10% of the cars continue down the freeway, 234, 235, and now, again, 85% of what's left behind is going to exit through fission. So by the time it gets to the first transuranic, Neptunium-237, only 1.5% in theory, it's actually lower than that in reality, but that's the theoretical maximum transuranic material you can produce. Why are we worried about transuranics? Because they govern the long-term uh, geologic hazard of, of this material. This is a graph that shows how long does it take spent nuclear fuel to reach uh, the same radiotoxicity level as natural uranium ore. 
In normal spent nuclear fuel, 300,000 years. It's a long time. And that's basically 10 half-lives of plutonium-239. If we were to remove uh, the minor actinides, you can reduce that to, uh, if you remove plutonium and uranium, you can reduce that to 9,000 years. But if you, if you had a system where you only had fission products, then it's down to 300 years. And that's 10 half-lives of strontium-90 and cesium-137. So really, that's the goal you want to get to. You want to get to a point where you're burning all of your actinides. You're not letting them enter the waste stream like they do now, but you're burning them up. I sometimes ask people, if you were to put uh, gasoline or petrol in your car, what fraction of consumption would you expect in your car? Would you accept 20% consumption of the gasoline? 90%? Uh, would that be all right? No, of course not. You want 100%. You put that fuel in your car, you want it all burned up. Only in the nuclear world do we accept less than a half a percent consumed as, as an acceptable level. And, and we get away with that because it's 2 million times more energy dense. So, you know, 0.5% times 2 million is still a big number. But it can be a much bigger number, and it should be a much bigger number, because people are justifiably concerned about the management of long-term nuclear waste. And by burning the actinides completely, we can eliminate the production of the uh, long-lived transuranic waste. I say eliminate because even this neptunium-237 is a very valuable material. We transmute that into plutonium-238, and that provides uh, special material for deep space probes. Uh, would, did anyone follow the flyby of Pluto last year as a uh, space probe New Horizons? Oh, Engineers, be ashamed. <laughs> that was a great accomplishment for humanity. Uh, that was powered by plutonium-238, and so we got our first view of Pluto because of, of uh, the power of that uh, material. So I, I even have a hard time calling that material waste. Another aspect of nuclear reactors that's important to understand has to do with a gas called xenon-135, and it is a rather common product of fission. Fission has a double-humped uh, product distribution, and, and 135 is, is one of the most common. Uh, it has an enormous neutron absorption cross-section. I mean, that's uh, the tiny absorption cross-section or fission cross-section of uranium-235. Uranium-233 is about the same size. You can see that uh, it's like comparing the sun to the earth as far as uh, absorption cross-section. It's absolutely enormous. And so having a reactor that can reject this material, this xenon, is important. Uh, it allows the reactor to be more responsive. It allows it to follow the load. For instance, if different power sources are coming on and off the grid, this reactor is going to be able to respond to it. Normal solid-fueled reactors trap xenon-135 in their solid matrix. And the xenon-135 has a, a retarding effect on the reactor's response. It makes it more difficult for the reactor to load follow. And it's possible, but it's a lot harder because of this effect. In the, in the liquid fuel, you can just about eliminate this, this concern. So we want to take the... the great work that was done at Oak Ridge National Laboratories, these historical concepts, demonstrations they did, and fold it into modern new designs for uh, uh, a liquid fluoride thorium reactor. Uh, this is a, a notion of, of what the lifter facility might look like. Modular, intended to be built uh, in multiple units, that's the reactor vessel uh, in a long silo, a power conversion system based on carbon dioxide, and uh, chemical processing and off-gas processing systems. Let me go through those a little bit. So the chemical processing system is designed to remove uh, certain products from the, the reactor during its operation and move them to other places or to remove them from the reactor system. The basic idea uh, has to do with a process called reductive extraction. This is where uh, a particular metal carrying a reductant causes another material to come out of solution. Uh, another technique is the fluorination of salt where uh, uranium, for instance, has two valence states, UF4 and UF6. One of them is gas. By taking advantage of that, we can do removals. And there's also electrolytic cells that will break uh, resultant products back into their original constituents. This is the overall view of the, of the liquid fluoride thorium reactor with the uh, chemical processing system broadly on this side and the power conversion system broadly on this side. We're going to walk a little bit through this. So, Within the reactor, the chemical processing system may be analogous to the kidney in your body that processes your blood continuously removing uh, particular products, or perhaps the liver. So let me talk first about the liver, uh, because that's taking good things out and putting them into other places. So the liver of the reactor is, is up here where the blanket fluid that surrounds the core that contains thorium is processed to remove protactinium and uranium, which through a series of steps, including an electrolytic cell, end up in this decay tank. And this decay tank is there because protactinium, as I mentioned earlier, had a 27-day half-life. So we need to get it out of the reactor, allowing it to decay outside of the core, and then to reintroduce it 
back into the reactor once it has completed its decay to uranium. And that's done by fluorinating that decay salt and adding it as a stream uh, back to this reduction column. Now the kidney part. The kidney part is from the, the fuel salt. The fuel salt contains both the fission products and the nuclear fuel, the uranium-233. So the first step is we let it cool down just a little bit in a drain tank, and then we fluorinate the fuel salt in order to remove any of the uranium present, because that uranium is very valuable, it's our fuel. We combine those two fluorinated uranium streams, now as UF6, back into that column. Then the remaining salt goes through another reductive extraction column. The reductant is lithium metal dissolved in bismuth, and that lithium will then reduce fission products from a salt state, you know, where they are oxidized, to a metallic state. It will essentially replace them in the salt with, with lithium. So they then leave as a, as a uh, extracted metal stream within bismuth here. The purified salt returns back to this column and is rejoined with the uranium hexafluoride, which is reduced by a column of hydrogen gas. The hydrogen will take two of the fluoride ions from uranium hexafluoride and reduce it back to uranium tetrafluoride, which is soluble. And then that salt plus its uranium load is returned to the reactor purified. The HF that comes then out of the reduction column is electrolyzed to recreate both the fluorine streams and the hydrogen streams. And so the reactor is designed to be a, as close to a closed system as possible, uh, implementing uh, several reductive and extraction processes. So the input is thorium fluoride, and uh, the output is, is the fission products that come out of that stream right there, stream 54. So by taking that approach, we think we can approximate that objective earlier of just having actin or, I'm sorry, just having fission products in the waste stream, no actinides entering the waste stream, and thus having a waste stream that is going to decay to background levels of 300 years. Okay, a lot more detail I'm going to go over, but you can download these slides, so you might want to review these later. Uh, so basically, three systems: uh, reductive extraction, fluorination, hydrogen reduction, and uh, well, four systems, and, and two electrolytic cells. This is the these are the the liver and the kidneys to the reactor. The off-gas is another part of it, the xenon and krypton that will come out of solution that allow the reactor to load follow safely. These are essentially shunted to a system where they are just going to decay away over a period of about 45 days. All the xenon decays to stability in about a month, and everything in the krypton, uh, except krypton 85, will decay away. So you'll be ended up, you end up with two gaseous streams. Uh, the krypton 85 can be isolated and could potentially be, be sold to uh, those who could who could use radioactive krypton, but the xenon stream is, is, uh, is completely stabilized by that point. Now within the reactor, I'm sorry, within the salt of the reactor, there are a couple of processes that lead to the production of tritium, which is hydrogen-3. Uh, the most common one being from residual lithium-6 in there. So tritium is a problem in this reactor design, and the power conversion system is a big part of addressing it. The power conversion system is based on supercritical carbon dioxide, which is a new and up-and-coming power conversion system technology. The reason that we're so interested in supercritical carbon dioxide is we want something that can allow us to capture that tritium, because tritium can diffuse across the walls of heat exchangers. So we make the assumption, it's a bit of a worst case assumption, that all of the tritium produced in the reactor is eventually going to diffuse into this carbon dioxide gas. Carbon dioxide contains no hydrogen. So if you do see hydrogen in your carbon dioxide, you can be pretty assured it's tritium. And so within the cooler parts of the system, uh, that tritium can be reacted with oxygen in carbon dioxide to form tritiated water, which is collected and separated and, uh, and kept from being released into the environment. And tritium itself is, is quite valuable, so uh, that will be something that we'll give to our friends at the Department of Energy. The supercritical carbon dioxide system is really remarkable. I wish I could, uh, I wish we had modern pictures of it, but if any of you have seen a large uh, steam turbine before, you know what big machines they are. I mean, they are rather substantial pieces of machinery. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that low-pressure steam is at such a low density. In this power conversion system, because of the high density of the carbon dioxide, the turbo machinery is much smaller. The equivalent turbo machinery to a large steam turbine would easily fit in this room, probably in a, in a fraction of this room. And it's not often that you see those kind of, those kind of uh, shrinkages possible in the size of turbo machinery. I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer. I mean, we get excited about 1% better efficiency. We, we're not like our friends in the, in the information world who are used to orders of magnitude improvement happening on a regular basis. So to see uh, technology where there could be that kind of reduction in size of turbo machinery is really exciting. So 
I was asked to talk about what are some of the challenges that we face going forward on this. And really, we're going to need to code qualify the alloys that are used in the system. We're going to have to have better pumps and heat exchangers. We're going to have to develop this, uh, this chemical processing system, the liver and kidneys of the reactor. We're also going to need to, pr to develop the separation of lithium isotopes so we can reduce the amount of tritium and, and develop the safeguard systems for this reactor. I kind of covered that. So to wrap things up, this thorium technology represents an ability to generate nuclear energy without generating plutonium. And it's been a while since we worked on it. It's been a great while. Technology doesn't advance unless we push it. And so the time really has come, in fact it came a long time ago, that we need to be pushing hard on this technology. And I'm very confident that we will be able to succeed. Uh, based on the, the successful work that was done at Oak Ridge, based on the tractability of the problems uh, facing this reactor going forward. I really think this can be done, and it can be done uh, within a timely manner. And I want to leave you with a quote from Alvin Weinberg, who ran the Oak Ridge National Lab during the 60s, during, when, when this work was happening. He called this future era of a new thorium-powered economy, he called it the second nuclear era. And he dreamt that someday uh, this would come to pass. During my life, I have witnessed extraordinary feats of human ingenuity. I believe that this struggling ingenuity will be equal to the task of creating the second nuclear era. My only regret is I will not be there to witness its success. I was fortunate to speak with Dr. Weinberg very briefly before he died in 2006. And he told me, I said, what did you think of the molten salt reactor? And he goes, oh, the molten salt reactor. That was a really good idea. <coughs> that still is a really good idea. <laughs> so, may we go forward to success. Thank you very much.